Hey everyone, um, I know I said I wasn't going to be doing videos, but here I am with a video. Uh, it's a chill one. It's uh, just like what I've been reading this year, what I thought was good, what I thought was terrible. In this book, I'm mostly going to be talking about books. Well, I'm only going to be talking about books I've read this year, but also um, I won't be talking about every book I've read this year, just kind of the ones that I find interesting enough. I'm not going to be talking about old books like classics and stuff, like I, I read Dracula this year, I'm not going to be talking about that. My method of reading is primarily on um, the Kobo, which is probably one of the like best purchases I've made this year. It's so light, it's com it's like in terms of like fixing like like working with my disability this is so good it can fit in like my little hip bag and i can just take it everywhere and actually read books on the go which i've not been able to do for a while just because books are either too bulky or too heavy this has also influenced what books I'm reading. Generally speaking, there'll be a book available for like 99p. I've ended up reading a kind of a wide range of genres, maybe more than it would be if I had to pick them up like physically and pay more for them. I'm gonna be sort of categorizing books on a scale of one to five. It's not an objective measure, it's just like what I think of it. One star means I actively dislike the book, two stars means I didn't like the book. Three stars means I like the book well enough. Four stars means I like the book a lot. And five stars means I love the book. I think that's everything. Uh, so with no further ado, let me tell you about the worst book I read this year. The Undead Mr. Tenpenny. Fantastic name, like really good name, really good cover. I enjoy the way this book looks. I love the like sense of like humor that's conveyed in the cover and the, the, the mystery and intrigue from the title. The first few chapters of this book are really good. It's like, it's very funny. It's about like um, this woman who works in a uh, funeral parlor. She's like one of those people who does um, make up on corpses. Some of the corpses start inexplicably coming to life. They haven't completed like their task. They've like got something left on earth that they need to like go and fix. She has to like help them find out what that thing is and then uh, they, 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 they get dead again. Which is a fantastic premise. I really like that premise. I really enjoyed the first three chapters. It's written in a really sort of humorous way. The main character is quite socially awkward and it's conveyed well. First three chapters are great. And then the undead Mr. Tenpenny comes into the story and unfortunately it's all downhill from there and like in a really steep manner. Where do I start with how weird this book gets and like not not in a good way like I like weird this is just not good weird. First off it basically it just it's just Harry Potter. She's like some kind of orphan, presumed orphan, who whose parents were like magical fighters fighting against the evil dark wizard who now has it in for her specifically. There's like a, a place she calls Magic Land, which like has some other name, but she calls it Magic Land, and um, it, it's Diagon Alley. Like it's just, it, it, it's just Harry Potter. It's literally just Harry Potter. The character herself constantly like references Harry Potter and is like, oh, what is this Harry Potter? And like, not quite as obvious as that, but pretty close. It doesn't help you to not just think of it as Harry Potter if you're constantly like putting Harry Potter in your readers' heads, like over and over again. And also it's not funny. Like it was funny, like it sort of, it was like, huh, the first time. And then after that, it just wasn't funny. The world in this, these books is like, slightly harder built than in Harry Potter, which is very like soft in terms of its rules. Um, so I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. This, the magic has rules in, in these books. How's that gonna affect the story? Um, and the answer is endless exposition. They spend so much time in these books just explaining how stuff works. And, and not progressing the plot. One second there's just her and these dead people running around and it's great. And the next second it's her and like 15 new characters. And like I hate it when they introduce a bunch of new characters at once. That was part of my problem with Dracula. I had to try reading it three times because the first bit where he's just in the castle is amazing. And then like, then suddenly there's all these ladies and they're all like, oh, my husband. And it's just not that interesting. And um, I said I wouldn't talk about Dracula. Why am I talking about Dracula? It's mind numbingly boring. I don't want to have to study to like, understand a plot. There are just a couple of really weird bits in it that just, it's just like, why did you put that in? They basically explain like, 
magics, which is what like wizards and witches are called in this book, magics need a lot of sugar to make their magic work. There's basically this bit where they try and exp say that like the slave trade was about magic users forcing non-magic users into slavery to like have control over sugar so that they could be more powerful. <sighs> like, uh, did you realize the implications there, Tammy? There's kind of a race element in 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 the whole like slavery thing. Are you saying that like what white people are magic and like black people weren't like like what? What is going through your mind when you try and, like, incorporate slavery into your story and, like, take ownership of it as part of your weird little magic? Like, what? It's so weird. Like, it's it's quite JK-esque, actually, with her whole, like, whatever whatever she was doing with World War II in, in Fantastic Beasts. I don't know. I didn't see the film. Just taking, like, serious historical events and then being like, oh, it was actually all about, like, my my magic thing. Just no regards to like what it was actually about or like how your explanation of events affects uh, 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 the, the the implications of what actually happened. Just, oh, it, I, do, I don't even, like, you know why this is bad. I, do, I don't need to explain it. Mindless white gibberish. That was not like the only example of just weird shit in this book, but like that that was the one that just kind of made me be like, what? <laughs> what am I reading? The main character who's kind of vaguely like, she's awkward at the start, but not like, not like nasty. She's really slut shamey towards this one character for like no reason other than like the men that she's interested in are interested in this woman. When I say slut shamey, I don't even mean with regards to her behavior. I mean like this woman is shamed for like just the body that she happens to have. It's just unpleasant to read. If my main character starts doing this stuff, I'm not gonna like them. And then incredibly, like you're gonna think I'm making this up, but incredibly this like, you know, misogynistic slut shaminess actually develops into like full-on transphobia uh, in exactly, the, almost exactly the same way as JK kind of expressed her transphobia through the characterization of Rita Skeeter in the Harry Potter books. If this author was inspired by JK Rowling, which she definitely was, then like, I mean, she's doing a good job. She's managing to hit every point. I don't know why I kept reading it. I think I just kept hoping it would like turn around and improve and go back to what it was at the beginning. One star and only because the beginning was great. Otherwise I'd have given it zero. The first um, two star book I would talk about would maybe be um, a book called Feather Tide, uh, which again, kind of suckered me in with its like interesting beginning. There's like a bunch of sex workers living in a brothel and there's this kid who is born there and she has um, feathers. They're all like, she has feathers. It's vaguely interesting. I don't, I, I like this like adult fairy tale genre. It's prettily written. It has some fun and interesting ideas. Like one of the locations is particularly nicely fleshed out. There's some just good description. I would say it's like, it's a bit over described. If you're gonna describe something that's like, white and fluffy. You don't need to go like, oh, it was white and fluffy, like a cloud or like a sheep's wool. You don't need to say two in one sentence. Like one is enough, if any, because like there are so many in this that at one point it's just like, you're just reading metaphors and that's kind of it. I think other than that, like this book hasn't got a lot going for it. Again, it just suffers from like a, a, a really unpleasant main character. She's just kind of this waif whose stuff just happens to. She doesn't have that much agency. Like she, she leaves home, which I guess is like something she does of her own volition, but then just stuff just happens to her. Like she falls in the river and someone pulls her out and just happens to just give her a home. And then she just goes somewhere and then someone just falls in love with her and she goes somewhere else and someone else just falls in love with her. There's no reason as to why all these characters are just falling in love with her, especially not the first one. Like it's unexpected gay. I will also give it that. I wasn't expecting it to be gay and then it was gay and I was like, oh, it's gay. But like, you know, this first character who's like a mermaid or something just falls in, just, 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 just just kisses her for no reason. Like, what did she do? Why, why did you, I mean, maybe she's hot, I don't know. But like, that that shouldn't, like, 
I don't think that's enough. I mean, maybe it's enough for some- you, you, you get what I'm getting at, there's just like all these characters going out of their way to do stuff for her, and she's just really ungrateful for it all. She doesn't seem to like have much respect for anyone, especially the person who like gave her a home. And the gay isn't even like that good because it gets interrupted by like this other person who's a guy and not only is he a guy but he's like, I mean it's okay to be a guy but you know if, if it's gay you don't want it to get interrupted. Do you? He is a some sort of scientist or like sociologist guy who specializes in like studying her tribe as in her like her bird people folk type people so like when he gets with her there's like very clearly this sort of fetishization of like her species thing going on and she's just cool with it and that's mm, that's not great i mean it can happen but i don't like reading it she just goes and like gets mad at her like mermaid girlfriend because like because the mermaid disappears and swims away eventually and can't be with her forever and like, what could have been a very sort of a, a decent message about, like, listening to your partner's communication um, it, it is sort of undercut by the fact that the mermaid's communication sucks. I didn't hate it, it was quite a sort of, like, pretty read, but I just didn't get much from it. Next in the two stars category, um, Binti. On paper, I should like it. It's like a short um, story series that's like um, Afrofuturist uh, space aliens stuff I like, but it, it just didn't do it for me. I think for a couple of reasons. Like one, I, I just don't think I understood what the main character was doing. She's meant to be some sort of like maths genius, right? but she she sort of seems to spend a lot of time in the book in a sort of trance-like state doing maths. Maybe I'm just shit at maths, maybe I just- that's the- that's why I don't get it. But the maths thing seems to also enable her to like communicate with other species and I don't see why maths would do that. There's some annoying gender stuff in it, like very mild, but like you know how I feel about like annoying gender stuff when it comes to aliens. There's just these like big jellyfish with big stingers that sort of invade the boat at one point and then they're like, oh, female humans suck. And it's just like, why would you even, why would you even have a strong opinion of like what a female human, it like, like do jellyfish, what w what's a gender for a jellyfish? Like, like what's their frame of ref, I just, it, why? She uses this sort of like traditional magic like earth stuff or, like on her skin and then when one of the jellyfish is injured she um, puts it on the jellyfish and it like heals the jellyfish and it's just kind of like I don't see why some earth from her planet should heal like a jellyfish from a completely different like solar system. Uh, like what's the connection? Like maybe Maybe it's explained as the book goes along, but uh, or like as the series goes along, but the thing is that because it's a whole series and um, each one is like seven or eight quid, I don't necessarily want to spend all that money on something that I may or may not enjoy. I usually need books, like unless they are like absurdly good, I need them to have a little bit of a sense of humour, which this was just completely lacking. Everyone talks in this like overly formal way without like contractions or slang or kind of just anything that, that resembles the way that real people speak. That kind of separates me from a book a lot of the time. It makes it over, it makes it stilted, it makes it less it just makes it less real because people don't talk like that. I don't really know what happened. I don't, I just read it and then I'm just kind of like, I don't, I don't really, I just didn't get it. I'd be interested to know what other people made if they've like read more of this series, like if it kind of gets better or like makes more sense as it goes along. Because like, honestly, like at the back, um, the author says that like their daughter, who's like four, came up with a lot of the plot beats for the story and, and no offense, but that like, that makes a lot of sense. Moving into the three stars category. I'm gonna start off with um, one of the books I've read most recently, The Secret Life of Albert and Twistle. This is a really lovely story. Um, it's about a, uh, 
sort of 60 something um closeted gay man who uh is a postman and um be- had like a, a relationship that ended badly with his sort of like teenage boyfriend and um sets out on this quest to uh try and and reconnect with him when um he's faced with retirement i like this book overall i think um it it, it the, the the topic matter is just really worth writing about and um if i'm gonna just sort of sit back and read like a feel good story it's nice to kind of learn something we weren't taught about gay history in school so like even if you are a queer person there's gonna be like gaps in your knowledge i am slightly ashamed to admit that i had no idea that there was like a gay village in manchester um that i found out from this book i didn't know that that was a thing there's a lot in it about the history and treatment of gay men in the UK. It's funny, it's interesting, it's um, just very warm, it's it's a nice story, it's not like a, it, it's not a very sort of trauma centric story, it's all very lovely and um, you know while still dealing with some like pretty hard hitting topics and I, I would say that's where it maybe doesn't hold up quite as much. You kind of get the sense that with one conversation like that each character in, in this book can sort of be turned from like a homophobe into an ally. While it does show what happened to him in flashbacks and I think all of that is actually done quite well, um, I don't think his trauma is really comes up. It doesn't completely shy away from that. Like there is a bit where he like breaks down, but it's like each time something bad happens, it just takes a couple of friends to be like, oh, Albert, like don't feel better, Albert. And he's like, oh, I'm so much better. I just don't think it would all be as nice as it is in this book. It's not the biggest like complaint in the world, but it did kind of make it like, th- there were no stakes eventually. And that kind of made it hard to, it, it made me care a bit less or like the, made the characters feel a bit less real. It also like handles race not badly for like a white person. Like it doesn't omit race altogether and it also doesn't handle it in this kind of like ham fisted way where it's like, oh yes, I remember when people painted slurs on doorsteps. Oh, and that was those were the bad old days. And that's like all the person of color has to say. It's not like that. It's more nuanced, you can tell that this person probably like actually has black friends. Although I do think the the author maybe needs to learn that like mixed race isn't like a description of what a person looks like. The Watchers. This is one of the weirdest like three star books because of uh, like the previous book was very sort of like all it was kind of three stars throughout, whereas this book is like, it has like five star sections and then like one star section. The author has some strengths and some weaknesses and they're very strong and very weak, uh, respectively. The plot, first off, like it's just an extremely creepy idea. I can't remember the exact rules for how the creatures work, but they don't come out at in during the day, they only come out at night. The forest is too big to to escape it during the daylight basically like by the time um by the time it was night you still wouldn't have cleared the forest so basically once you're in there you're stuck you're stuck in the only safe place in the forest which is like this weird building that all the characters find themselves in um and it's about like how they survive there in the, the wilderness um surrounded by these creatures that will kill them unless they play by very specific rules. It's very creepy. I like what the creatures are a lot. I like some of the the locations, like the way that um the 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 main character we're with um most of the time, the way she interacts with one of the creatures for the first time through the glass wall in this building is really creepy it it's very very good it's almost like a jump scare and like it's it's cool that a book jump scared me the description of locations and stuff is very top tier very good i really liked it the weaknesses are to do with character interaction and kind of flow the conversations just are a bit like jagged and weird. They don't flow in a way like conversations actually would, like with one subject leading on naturally to the other. It's, they're just kind of saying things. The book will change from one character's perspective to another 
without any clear like delineation it throws you off it makes you like unsure who you're kind of with at that point um and and it even does it in in ways like it will actually shift location without really telling you that it's doing that so there's one point where the characters are all running and the creatures are coming after them and at one point it's like oh the characters are doing xyz and then it's like the creatures all came out of their burrow in the this that and the next thing and like how do they know that they're 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 not there like how do we know that we're not there either like it just jumped to a completely different location without telling us. Also, I feel like that kind of, it, that's not good for like horror. Horror is scary when you don't know what's coming. So like if you can avoid telling us what's coming, which which easily could have happened there, th- then don't. Some plot points don't make sense because crucial details are kind of left out or the characters don't interact in a way that makes sense and therefore you don't find out information that you you should need to know in order to make the plot make sense. Characters do things that they just wouldn't. It makes it hard to keep the disbelief suspended when, when characters are just fling themselves into danger. I'd say it's it's like got some really, really good elements about it. Like the overall idea is great and um I I wanted to find out what happened. I wanted to find out what was going on and I love the ending. I love just um the creativity of it. I think it's just a really, really good idea that was quite clumsily executed. Honestly, if there's one thing that's really surprised me this year with reading like a lot more than I I used to and a lot kind of more randomly as well, I've been a bit surprised at like just some of the 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 quality of book. I kind of had it in my head that like you had to your writing had to be a certain level of good to get published, but it, it turns out that's not true. Very basic stuff is kind of not done in this book. And I'm just like, how did the editor, like, where is the editor? But it was good, it was good. I would recommend this book. I would recommend all the books in the in the three stars category. Finally, uh, Southern Reach trilogy. I'm plonking the whole trilogy in the three stars category, or, but even though like some of the books I would class differently because like, overall I'd say that I, I can't be bothered talking about all the books individually. If you've seen the film Annihilation, I do think you would still get something out of reading the book because it's uh, it's quite different. There's a whole bunch of things in it that are not in the film. It just expands the Annihilation experience. Like if you liked that film, this will just kind of enrich, the first book anyway, it will just kind of enrich that experience by providing like an additional sort of canon to draw from. For those who, who aren't familiar with Annihilation, it's basically a, a story about a weird zone that appears which people can enter but they can't come out of and therefore nobody really knows what's in it. And it follows this group of four or five women who um, all have different skills and it's mostly told from the point of view of a biologist who go in to to see what's up. If you're into sort of stuff that is scary and about, basically about the inexplicable, um, this is a good book for you. The thing about writing truly alien perspectives is that it is not possible because we are human and therefore anything we come up with is ultimately a human perspective, even if you make it sound as alien as you want. I do think there have been like good, um, g- good attempts at doing stuff like that. Like I think, uh, like the, the film Annihilation is good. I think that the, um, what's it called? The one where they communicate. Arrival? Yeah, I think that that one does a good job of it as well, of like trying to convey, like trying to show a perspective that is truly alien. I think that as much as the indescribable can be described, Annihilation, the book, does a good job of it. Which is really impressive because that's that is so, so hard to do. I wouldn't know... I wouldn't know where to start. The first book, Annihilation, I would rate very highly. I would rate it higher than than three. The following books, like, I like the second one a lot. I don't think it would be to everyone's taste. It's kind of like a sort of, um, like my friend described it as a a kind of passive aggressive office drama, which I think it, it kind of is, except with this like sort of um, supernatural undertones and, and creepy, uh, creepy vibe. I liked it a lot. It's arguably not as good as the first one, but I liked it. And the third one just 
kind of drags the other two down. I'm very much in the camp that like, I think you should either explain something properly or just not explain it. Don't like half ass an explanation and the third book just, it's just half an ass the whole way through. I wouldn't bother with that one if I were you, honestly, because it's very long. It feels like it ends about like five times before it actually does. Four stars, we are on to Go Woman Other. One of the most notable things about this book, she just, breaks every rule but like not in like not in a way like the with the, the the watchers where it's just kind of like you you don't know what the rules even are do you the whole thing is written almost like a almost like in in verse there's very little punctuation she doesn't use capital letters she doesn't use full stops the way that she places sentences and words directs your attention to what is most important and gets somehow to the point of what is actually being said in a way that is much more effective than if you just write normally. That's really impressive and um, very unique and, and one of many, many things that's really good about this book. It's 12 narratives of non-male black UK people. It does read like a short story collection, like because each each character's narrative is often like a completely separate narrative, but they connect. It's really ambitious, like the way that the, the stories are all interwoven um, must have taken so long to like plan out and figure out how these stories all link to each other. It tackles such a range of topics from like the politics of like selling out within leftism to um, abusive uh, relationships or just abuse in general and like racism and like, like just, there's just so much in there and it is all told with a sense of humor. It's really funny, like extremely funny and, and, and real mood whiplash as well because it can be so funny one second and then like incredibly painful and difficult to read the next. Um, and I like that. I like that it, it keeps you moving through. Like if you want one book that just gives you every experience, I think this is the one. One like sort of highlight. I mean, it's a bit weird to call this a highlight because it's like a really like nasty bit of the book, but I think it was just done so well is one bit where one of the characters ends up in an abusive relationship with someone who basically uses the language of progressiveness to assert dominance and control over other people. And it, it could be so easy to do that wrong. You know, when you get like some sort of awful think piece in like The Guardian or something where it's like, oh, people who have marginalized identities actually have more power than everyone else because they can tell everyone else what to do. Like that's just, just not a thing. But within like micro communities, if everybody buys the same ideology, then like you can leverage a marginalized identity in a way that you shouldn't. And um, and I have seen that happen and I, I do know what that looks like. I've never experienced it in, in as extreme a way as it happens in this book, but I think the way it plays out is perfect. I don't think it is at any point um, going, oh, you know, watch out for those feminists, they're the real abusers. I don't think at, at any point it does that. It just shows how if you lose the capacity to think for yourself and to critically consider every bit of information that's given you, no matter who, who it comes from, um, what can happen and how people can abuse power, like where in the, the niche micro communities where they have it. It was just so impressively done. It felt real. I was like, this could, 100% happen. Can't say the same about the trans chapter. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't good. The person narrating that chapter is is a non-binary person called Morgan. It takes you through their like sort of gender journey from childhood and um that that's not terrible. It's it's fine. They don't have a gender. They don't identify with the concept of gender. It seems like from what I can gather their gender is basically identical to mine. Um, except they just arrive on it in a slightly more straightforward way, whereas I, I went on a whole weird... The terminology that the trans characters use is not terminology used by trans people, in my experience. For example, um, the, the main character, like, th their gender, as I've said, is like, sort of, it seems like agender, um, but they use the term gender-free. A, that's just it's just not a term that's used, it's not, it could be, 
But it isn't. It's also specifically a term that was used by TERFs because it, it has that con connotation. It just seems particularly odd to like have a trans person in this call themselves gender free. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is a term used by like non-binary people. I've just never come across it. And then Morgan also like later on says something like, oh yeah, me and all the other non-binaries. No, we, that's just, nobody says that. So a couple of little things like that. Um, to start with, that sort of indicated like, oh, I don't know if this bit's going to be as good as the rest of it. Like every other chapter, um, it, there's kind of an awareness of like the the less good sides of like the trans community. Intercommunity policing can be very like vicious and very merciless and very kind of one person puts one foot wrong and then they're like, you're dead to, to everyone like that can happen. However, the way it happens in this book just doesn't ring true. For example, when Morgan is first like figuring out their identi I identity, figuring out their identity and uh, they start chatting online with a trans woman who is called Bibi, I think. At one point they say something that's like not 100% correct about non-binary people and Bibi pretty much just bites Morgan's head off for it. Honestly, like, I think this whole idea of, like, trans people will just, like, get mad at you if you use the wrong pronoun, get mad at you if you say the slightest wrong thing, like, it's so fundamentally untrue in the wider world and when we are one-on-one -on -one with each other. There's so much patience that has to be exercised just to get by, by most people. And, um, when you're talking to, like, a baby trans, you... You, you don't, you just don't snap their head off for saying the wrong thing. People are, in my experience, tend to be quite gentle and quite, like, caring and quite forgiving. Bibi basically bites Morgan's head off for saying something that I didn't think was that big a deal. But then later on, while they're, like, on their first day, Bibi says something like, Oh, I would never want to be one of those trans women who thinks that they know more about being a woman than someone who's lived as one their entire life, with reference to Morgan. Let me tell you, if, if you want to know about like, like people being harsh on Twitter, that that is the take that would get you cancelled, not like whatever it was that Morgan said previously. There's so many reasons as to why that's like a bit dodge, but like, I, I think in particular, it's it's the idea that Morgan knows what it's like to be a woman, because as far as I can gather, like Morgan never has been a woman. So how would they know what being a woman is like? Like, I don't. I, I, like, I really don't. Like, I know what it's like to be treated like a woman, but that's a different thing to what it is to be a woman. Um, categorically, if you are a woman, you know more about being a woman than someone who isn't a woman. I think it's telling that of, 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 uh, out of a book of, of narratives that, that are otherwise overwhelmingly female narratives, the, the only trans one is an AFAB genderless person rather than the AMAB trans woman. Unlike the rest of the book, this particular um, chapter really does read like it was informed by think pieces by cis people in The Guardian rather than like by interactions with trans people and knowledge of the actual trans community. I'm not saying it would be impossible for characters like Morgan and BB to exist and to have the opinions they do, but it, 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 when that is the only trans narrative in the entire book, there's nothing to counteract it. The only thing there to counteract the trans bit is, is like, other people who are either just don't get trans people or are downright transphobic, and, um, and, and they're written very well. They seem completely believable. She should have just stuck with the girl woman, honestly, like, she clearly knows what she's talking about there, and I don't think she knows what she's talking about when it comes to non-binary people. I 100% think that cis people can write trans characters. I'm not someone who's like, you should only write within your own experience, but if you're not willing to do the work, you know, we need, we need better representation than this, and this is a really popular book, and people are gonna read this and think that, like, think that non-binary is a type of woman. It's an excellent book. It's really good, even if it does have, like, one of these stupid, like, stickers that's stuck on it that, like, you know, you want to do, you want to get it off and then you can't get it off and that's really upsetting. That aside, like, it's a really, it's, it's an excellent, excellent book and, um, 
I, I, the only reason I didn't give it five stars is is because of that one chapter. It just kind of soured the experience. For me, my dark Vanessa, a 14 or 15 year old girl who like has an affair with her like 43 year old like teacher. Um, I, I can't quite remember the ages, but something like that. One narrative tells that story and the other narrative is her in her 30s basically in the middle of the Me Too movement, trying to reconcile with her past and trying to, 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 to work out what actually happened to her. Other victims come forward and people start approaching her and asking her for her, um, her, her take on the issue. And at first she's very like loyal to the guy, but then she's like, should I be? And, and the book is just exploring that. Um, I thought it was really good, like brilliantly written. It is like evocative, it's disgusting, it's um, painful. Um, I, it's, it's very nuanced. In this story, the girl consents as much as you like can in that situation. Obviously like a, a minor can't consent, etc. But like, you, you know what I mean? It deals with the situation in all of its complexity and with all of the characters in all of their complexity and like imperfect um, morality. Nobody's like 100% good or bad in this story and I love that because people just aren't. Anyone who has ever been in an abusive relationship th that's to do with any kind of power dynamic, even if it's not like, if, if it's not that particular one, will get some kind of catharsis out of this book. Um, the, the only reason I haven't rated it as five stars is just because, like, there's a limit to, like, how much enjoyment I can get from a story about that. The Last Library. This is another, like, feel-good little read. I don't have too much to say about it. I just liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to. I thought it just wouldn't, wouldn't pack that much emotional punch, but it, it did, and it was nice. I like reading about, like, uh, you know, small town little, little village people with who everybody knows each other and all that kind of stuff. I've never lived in a place like that and it sounds nice-ish, I suppose. I know, I'm getting tired. <laughs> I'm also gonna mention Trick Mirror and put that in this category. It's a collection of essays. I've not finished reading it yet, but uh, I, I think each of those essays kind of opened my brain in a new way and um, I don't really have a higher compliment for a selection of essays than that. I think it's just brilliant. Like the, the author's um, way of expressing what she means without like waffling on with a million words and still not like conveying anything that makes that much sense like I do. I don't know how she does. It's just so sharp and so like on point and so, um, I just got something new from every single one and um, I expect that by the time I've done it, I've finished with it, it will be in like the, the top category of books that I've read this year. Um, I just haven't finished it yet. Five stars. First off, The Murderbot Diaries. Uh, I, I, there are some, obviously some books, I think there's like seven books in the series and I have one more to go. Um, I, I'm putting, just putting the whole series up in the five star section because like obviously there are some books I enjoyed more than others, but the whole series is fantastic. Everything I'd been complaining about with the Wayfarers is just a non-issue in these books. Gender is just fine. Polyamory is just fine. All that stuff is just there. It's not a big deal. It's not even particularly relevant to the story. It's just done well and simply and that's all I was asking for. I love Murderbot. I love the main character. I, I think there are so many traps you can fall into when you're writing about like indentured robots and this avoids every single trap. You would read it as like sort of autistic, definitely, like the kind of the way, or at least neurodiverse, some form of neurodiverse, the way that the robot interacts with people or prefers or, or, or like their ways that they interact but they don't the author doesn't confuse that with like emotionalistness or a lack of care or like any of this other stuff that people think that autism is like obviously you can make the argument that it's the robot isn't autistic it's just a robot but like you know you, know, you can it, it, things mean things i loved it i love the portrayal of murderbot i love the, the, the action is so fun, um, the, the comedy is on 
point. It's just, it's just great. I don't have too much to say about it, to be honest. It's just a wonderful series. It's just got one of the best protagonists that I've, like, read about in a long time and honestly I'm kind of like putting off the last book because then it's over and unless unless the author is writing more I don't know. Has anyone read any other stuff by this author? I would be intrigued to know if if her other stuff is good. Is it she? Most of my spending money for books this year has just gone on the Motorbot Diaries. I'm willing to spend more money or more stuff by this person if it's good, but I'd like to know your opinion. The Wolf and the Woodsman. Um, this is an odd one to maybe put in the, the, the top, um, category, but I, I just can't think of anything bad to say about it other than, like, it drags a bit, maybe, and it sort of suffers a little bit from that kind of, um, th that kind of overly formal thing that I was talking about before with Minty. And it's not very funny, like, I usually need books to be a bit funny, so this is maybe my, like, my least favourite of the top books. But it- I got a lot more than I expected to get from this book. I never sort of transitioned through young adult books as a young adult. I kind of, like, I was reading Twilight at the same age as I was reading, like, Waiting for the Barbarians. After I'd, like, graduated from kids' books, I just would read anything. I think I first started reading Waiting for the Barbarians when I was, like, 12, actually. My mum just had that books on the bedside table, you know, I'd be like, oh, this is... Oh, it's not very nice. So I didn't really know what to expect because I haven't read a whole lot of young adult books. Like always, I based it on kind of the beginning and the beginning is just a bunch of people running around getting prepared for the arrival of like some sort of enemy who they have some sort of agreement with and, um, and, and nailing trees to the ground so that the trees don't run away because otherwise the trees are gonna run away and I was just like, I like that. I like the idea of trees running away. Let's give this a read. The depiction of oppression is done in a way that's better than like most fantasy, right? Most fantasy kind of does it in like a way that kind of like oversimplifies the actual issues and um, doesn't quite grasp the complexity of what it means to be oppressed and how, how the relationship with the oppressor works in all of these kind of very uh, subtle and entangled ways that, um, that, that 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 aren't just easily expressed through just like, oh, these people are in charge and these people are not. Particularly stuff to do with the fact that like the oppressors need the oppressed, that they sort of use elements of the oppressed like culture and in this particular book like their magic and their um, th they draw stuff from them, a lot of their own traditions come from them and like they need them in certain ways but they also want to eradicate them and it's it's like that that complexity, if I'm remembering correctly, it is shown in this book in a way that I was not expecting and was pretty impressed with. Moving on to like my absolute favourites, um, one of the best books I read this year was called Bearhead by Adrian Tchaikovsky. It's about a guy working to like terraform Mars in like a sort of pre-settlement colony who who ends up with an activist who is code inside his head who is also a bear which sounds like, way too many unrelated elements to put in one book. That's something I, I can't actually usually hack. If there's too many things that, that there's just not enough to tie them together or explain why they're all happening, then, like, um, it, it, I have to suspend too many unrelated areas of disbelief and I can't do it. So, like, a good example of that would be something like, a, like, like Up, for example. Because it's like, okay, so there's a guy and he's sad and he misses his wife and then he, like, he ties a bunch of balloons to his house and then the house goes up. And it's like, okay, so that's one level of disbelief suspended that, like, he can just float off somewhere in his balloon house. Like, fine, fine. But then, then he lands in a forest where there's, like, also, like, some sort of magic mythical bird and, like, okay, sure. But and then there's also dogs that 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 have like that can talk through like technology and 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 some sort of like evil guy who's trying to trap the bird and it's just like none of this none of this is connected it's too many moving parts I don't get it and I just switch off at that point I'm like I don't I can't stay invested in something that is so uh, like where there just isn't, where anything could happen. There's no grounding for like what we can and can't expect. Despicable Me is another one actually. Like there's a couple of films that are just like really popular that I don't, 
I hated because they were just too complicated. Like, I'm just... What? What? Like, a man who wants to steal the moon... Like, why would you want to do that in the first place? But he wants to steal the moon, and he also gets saddled with, like, three kids, and he also, like, has an army of minions which are just blobs, and it's not explained what they are. I can't hack that. I can't. So, like, the premise of this book... I'm surprised I even picked it up, to be honest, because, like, the premise, it just sounds so... Um... It sounds so not cohesive, but it all makes sense. All of the elements, tie, I'm not going to explain it, but the elements tie into each other in, in ways that work. Like all of this technology, if you buy like the overall premise of the book, would have happened at sort of the sim a similar time. Like, like the animals, like genetically engineered animals that are basically people that are sort of fighting for rights are happening at round about the same time that more genetically engineered people are being sent to like colonize Mars. It's like, it, it does all sort of make sense. It's a smart, funny book that deals with really pertinent topics to do with like, you know, environmentalism and extremism and just like, uh, I guess like what it means to like be considered human, citizenship and rights and stuff, and it, it, which sounds dry, but it's not, it's not dry. It's so, so good. It's so, um, the plot is so compelling. It's so, um, it's so interesting. There's so many like moral quandaries in it. It's like the characters are great. The characters are so fun and so brilliantly thought out. And just there's so many different spheres of like life, the perspective of this like, you know, Mars worker contrasted with this like academic bear who just he just ends up saddled with and just the way that they interact. It's so it's so good. It's so good. Once something gets is is too good for me to talk about, I can't talk about it coherently because it's I just think it's really good. Finally, um we're getting to my the best book I have read this year. This is a bunny by Mona Awa. I was describing Bojack Horseman to someone once. I was like, it is the best TV series I've ever seen. Cause it, it was at the time. And I still think it's one of the best ones. And he was just like, whoa, 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 like, 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 like back off with that level of praise. Cause you're gonna set my expectations up really high for it. And then if it doesn't meet those expectations, then, then what? And I was like, okay, no, you're right. But, but I, I can't help it. This is just who I am. I don't know what else to say about this book, except like it is, the best thing I've read this year and probably the best thing I'm gonna have read in in like many years. It is vicious, it is vivid, it is visceral, it is other adjectives beginning with V. This book will will hurt you. This book will will like will will, will bite you. If you don't like being bit, don't read this book. It has a a writing style that is so detailed and so precise and so evocative that it, it verges on obscene. From the very first page, you get a sense of of what this book is gonna be like, how gruesome and how witty and how how um how how just sharp and brilliant it's gonna be. And and it doesn't disappoint. And I'm setting the expectations way too high. But like I, I can't. I I can't help it. I can't help it. I don't have anything else to say except, you know, you want me to just say nothing about it, except just read it. Just read it. It's so imaginative. It's so original. I don't know. I don't know what the author was thinking. I don't know how they came up with this or thought this is a good idea. It's a book that really knows what it is. It knows it's a book. And like, not in a way that gets too meta, but in a way that kind of messes with like your conception of reality. It's got kind of like aspects of every genre that I enjoy. It's really dark and really funny and um, really painful. I can't even tell you what it's about. I can't tell you what it's about. It's just too... It, 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 to say anything about this book, I think, would ruin it. I think that's everything. I think that's everything. I'm exhausted. I've, I, I, I always sit down and I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm just gonna like, I'll just, you know, f you know, fob my way through this one. I'll just kind of like, not say too much. And I end up always just kind of like yelling <laughs> about everything. It's been nice to just do a, a, a sort of, casual video that doesn't require as much work and just, you know, let you know what I've been up to lately. Let me know about the books you've been reading this year. What's good? What should I avoid? What uh, what would you recommend for next year? I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. Um, and uh, the music is going well. Music is going well. So um, thank you so much for your support. A couple of people actually like 
upped their support. Like, I was expecting people to cancel it. A couple of people did, but some people were like, I'm going to pay you more to do this. And I was like, Ew. like it's, it's really kind. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm so looking forward to releasing the EP, and I do think it will be out um, this coming year, 2022. I think I can do that. I think I can. That's all. Thanks for watching. Uh, see you next time. Bye.